Super Sponge was a fascinating installment in SpongeBob history. Despite being its first game on a home console, it isn't talked about very much. That is, unless people are discussing the disturbing images that were found on old development CDs. That was weird. But in our last video, we checked out the PlayStation version and found it to be pretty decent. It was a fine platformer and kept in touch with the SpongeBob universe. It also had an amazing soundtrack. Though I did have a few criticisms, but that's par for the course with any video game. Some stages seemed a bit ruthless with their obstacles, and some items didn't seem to work like they were supposed to. The jellyfish net was more trouble to use than it was worth, and the karate glove didn't last long enough. And those accursed cephalopod enemies will haunt me for the rest of my life, I swear. And while this isn't necessarily a criticism, the developers made some strange decisions, too. Man Ray, one of the biggest recurring antagonists in the show, just appeared as a regular henchman and went down with one hit. Also, all your friends were able to travel back in time without any explanation. But it's enjoyable enough, and kids who grew up watching Spongebob could have a lot of fun with it. So now let's look at the version that came out for the Game Boy Advance. Like with the PlayStation Edition, this was made by Climax Group. Again, that name has a whole new meaning after seeing those images. This adaptation has been praised for being remarkably true to its console counterpart, which can't be said for the grand majority of SpongeBob games. I guess it helps to have the same developer. So let's check it out and see how we feel. One of the first things you might notice is that even the music is true to the console version. Listen to this comparison. It's more digitized, but I'm glad they mostly kept true to it. The music was one of my favorite things about it. It has a similar system to Legend of the Lost Spatula where you enter a password to continue where you left off, but it's slightly better this time. There are only four characters to remember, and because the stages aren't as long this time around, you don't lose as much progress as you did before. The story is also the same as the console version. The dialogue is even repeated word for word. SpongeBob wants to get an autographed picture from Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy for Patrick's birthday present. Though I will say one thing about this. Due to the Game Boy limitations, the cutscenes aren't that detailed and you only really get walls of text for dialogue. So some of the jokes, such as Barnacle Boy trying to get rid of SpongeBob or hiding from him, don't translate very well when you can't see what they're doing. If you want the full story, you gotta buy a PlayStation. <laughs> bottom. Barnacle Boy sends Spongebob to collect ingredients for a sandwich in exchange for the autograph. You then get dialogue from Squidward where he gives you a jellyfish net, one of your first items. Thanks Squidward, I'll take it, just please don't send your entire family after me. Now remember when I mentioned that I wasn't a big fan of the jellyfish net in the console version? Surprising as it sounds, it seems a lot easier to use in this one. You can catch jellyfish with it, then you fling them forward like a projectile. And that's not all. Remember the karate glove that Sandy gave you and it disappeared before you could really ever use it? Well, it's your permanent weapon now, so you don't have to try and butt slam every single opponent. I don't believe it. We've only just started and the Game Boy version already has a few improvements to the console one. There are other similarities, such as the stage locations, the enemies you meet, and the fact that you collect golden spatulas. This time, however, you don't lose them Sonic-style whenever you get hit. You have a separate health counter that goes down whenever you take damage. Also, jellyfish can hurt you this time. Darn, I was just getting used to them being my friends. The first stage is jellyfish fields, and while there are a lot of enemies that can hurt you, such as these slug things that are ripped straight from the PlayStation version, the developers were awfully generous with this particular level. You can collect pieces of fast food to replenish your health, the opposite of what it does in real life. But some stages are more generous than others, so don't get cocky just yet. So moving on... Oh no, the squids are back. Listen, I just know Squidward himself paid a visit to the Anti-Lucy Club and volunteered to do me in, but it required calling in the whole extended family. Every single cephalopod is out to get me. To defeat the squids and enemies that move in similar fashions to them, you have to time your attack perfectly so you hit them when they come within range, otherwise they clobber you. I also really dislike these enemies that shoot attacks like a volcanic eruption. They usually hit you before you even reach them. Also, I'm not sure why these moving jellyfish platforms are phasing in and out of reality. We already know that jellyfish are an intelligent alien species, so who knows what else they're capable of. 
After Jellyfish Fields, you head to Sandy's Tree Dome where you can climb her tree for the next sandwich ingredient. This platforming section was really difficult when I first tried it on PlayStation, so I was surprised to find that it's even harder in this. You're running out of water, so you have to keep jumping in pools to replenish your counter. They give you plenty, but it's easy to keep falling off the platforms. They also just outright give you this helmet that stops your water from draining altogether. How nice of them. Next up is Fish Hooks Park, aka the Carnival. Here you avoid an onslaught of enemies and jump on hooks to use them as platforms. You might be confused at first because you specifically have to jump on the hook part of them. Falling in a hole is an instant death, so this is the first stage you really have to be careful in. Then we head downtown, which is also crawling with enemies. Now you have cars trying to run you down, but you can launch yourself into the sky by stepping on these sewer lids. Then you reach the first boss, the Mother Jellyfish. To fight her, you catch jellyfish and fling them at her while avoiding her stings. This can be hard because the regular jellyfish can hurt you and might do more damage than their mother. But once you drain her health, you bring the sandwich to the superheroes and they send you to the center of the earth to find supplies to give Mermaid Man a facial. Now this is one stage I was looking forward to. The music for this was probably my favorite in the whole game on PlayStation. So let's listen to this rendition and see how it compares. Wait, huh? Is that sound effect really necessary? Why did they add that? So Mr. Krabs gives you a coral blower for your next weapon. This time, you suck something in, then immediately shoot it out afterwards. So it's less complicated than it used to be. However, Mr. Krabs tells you to watch out for Plankton, and this is another bit of the game that didn't translate well to the new version. In the original, the superhero handbook mentions that the chapter's boss is one of Plankton's robots. Since this doesn't have the superhero handbook, you just get warned about Plankton for no reason. The first stage is a lot easier than it is on the PlayStation. It isn't unexpectedly detailed this time around. In the next one, Patrick gives you one of his birthday balloons, but you don't use it very much. You just have a lighter glide when you make a jump. You also go against bombs that explode and send shrapnel at you. It's fun to set off chain reactions. And yeah, the skull blocks that can damage you even if they don't slam on your head have made a return. Also, these eels that fly into you and electrocute you are some of the worst enemies I've had to face. If you land on spikes or lava, you bounce back and can try to land on a nearby platform. Just make sure you don't land back on the spikes or lava. At least they aren't an instant death. But now let me introduce you to what might be my least favorite section of the entire game. Is this hell? Yes, Lammy, this is hell. It both looks like it and plays like it. These platforms are terrible to jump on. If the fire hits you, there's no recovering. You will instantly fall into the lava and it will count as an instant death. You will lose a life and have to start the section all over again. To top it off, you aren't done once you get past these narrow platforms. If you die to these snails, you have to do the whole thing all over again from the very beginning of it. And it leads into a boss. They really wanted to torture players with this section. The boss is the sub-shark who dashes around and tries to chomp you. It also drops these containers that explode if they hit you. Also these blue lasers from below. When it goes in for a chomp, that's when you hit it. You keep doing this until it goes down. And guess what happens if you die? That's right, you have to start the platforming section all over again. How absolutely merciless could they have possibly been? But once that's done, Barnacle Boy sends you back to prehistoric times to find new uniforms for him and Mermaid Man. You use Plankton's time machine and head into the next chapter. The stages are much easier in this chapter, and you can even jump on these funny-looking trees. Just ride them to the finish until Patrick gives you the bubbles. With these, you can blow your own platforms to jump on. But last time I tried using bubbles to cross a chasm, it didn't end so well for me. The last stage here takes place inside a whale, though you aren't shown going into it this time. It's easy enough, but the final boss is strange. This worm zips in and out of the stage, popping in again to dive at you. You have to aim where it's going to return from and hit the attack button at just the right moment to land an attack. Sometimes, even if I think I aimed it perfectly, I still miss. Also, this tunnel going down is the first thing you see before the boss appears. But if you jump into it, you die. Talk about a beginner's trap. When you win, Barnacle Boy sends you to get his favorite kelp bar from Rock Bottom. Surprisingly, this makes the same exact mistake as the console version where he refers to it as Bikini Bottom. You would think they'd have time to fix that between releases. You have to collect coins for a vending machine throughout spooky-themed levels, and guess which enemies make a return? 
Ugh, the octopi are back. And they can shoot you. God, I hate them so much. Though these starfish are even harder to fight. Hitting them sends them flying in a different direction. These stages aren't too hard, but the Flying Dutchman boss fight is a little confusing. He phases in and out, flying up and down while shooting fireballs. You have to hit him when he's open, but it isn't really apparent when he is. Just keep doing it whenever you feel like you can, he'll go down eventually. Then for the final chapter, you need tools to fix Mermaid Man's TV. You head to Industrial Jellyfish Fields, which is filled with tar. Then Man Ray's Lair, which is missing something very important. I can't quite put my finger on it, but I feel like it really needs something. Something like, oh, uh, I don't know, Man Ray? Yeah, it's Man Ray's lair and he isn't even here. Not even as a henchman this time. This chapter is easy up until the oil rig stage. You have to navigate enemies and fire obstacles, but they actually go a long time without giving you any extra health. It's basically an endurance test. But it's worth it because the final stage is on this cool boat factory place. The final boss is this iron dogfish. All you really need to do is avoid falling obstacles and hit him whenever you can. Check this out, we both died but I still won. I love it when games do that. Then you fix the TV, the superheroes give you the autograph, then you head to Patrick's party and win the game. So that was the Game Boy rendition of Super Sponge, and like I said, it's a very true handheld adaptation. This might be good to have if you want to play it while you're out somewhere. But again, you don't really get the full story or experience from this version alone. For the most part, it's pretty good and you can kill some time with it. Not bad if you want some Spongebob on the go. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go fishing. I have a few cephalopods to settle a score with. Thank you for joining me, I will see you in the next memory.